It is another exciting day. So let's get started with a truly, truly remarkable human who really needs no introduction whatsoever, General George Casey. He has an unparalleled bio, which you can read on the conference website. General George Casey served our armed forces for 41 years. He was Army Chief of Staff. In some of the most significant world events in the past several decades, General Casey was not only in the room, but on the ground. Um, but I will say this, because listing his achievements alone could take a full hour, and you can read about them on, on the website, cornell.systems. I, I meet a lot of people with long bios and big achievements, but I always do a kind of a, what I call a human check to see if they've gained the wisdom of their years, experience to be good and do good to make the world a better place. It is not enough merely to ac be accomplished. Those accomplishments, we hope, bring us some level of wisdom and connection to our own humanity and to humanity itself. And Laura and I have the distinct honor of getting to know General Casey through his work at Cornell. And he is not only an accomplished man, but a genuinely good human being. So please welcome General George Casey. Wow. Well, well thank you, Derek. <laughs> I, I very much appreciate that, that kind introduction. Let me see if I can get organized here and get that screen up. How are we doing? I see your screen, yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you very much again. And hello, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, where, where, wherever you may be. Um, as Derek was saying, I'd like to talk to you about our VUCA world, but more particularly, I'd like to talk to you about leading in it. Because even though it's getting harder to lead today, effective leaders can and will make a difference in our volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. And, and from my time in the Army, we, we believe in the Army that anyone can become a better leader. And, and so what I want to do today is, is to talk to you uh, about what it takes to lead successfully in our VUCA world. I'll talk to you a little bit about our environment and, and its impact on leaders. Uh, and then I'll suggest some things that leaders need to be and do to be able to lead successfully uh, in, in our VUCA world. And, and uh, to relate it back to what, what you were doing and talking about over the, the yesterday and today, uh, it, it requires a different way of thinking about things. And I'll talk to you about uh, the offensive mindset that I think is required to lead effectively today. Uh, but before I dive into that, I mean, I'm sure some of you are saying, what the heck is the general doing at Cornell? And uh, I, this, uh, this uh, fall semester will be my eighth year, I'll start my eighth year at Cornell. And frankly, I, I came up in, uh, to Cornell uh, at the invitation of the veterans group at the business school. And they asked me to, to give a talk on Veterans Day, which I did. And then they asked me if I talked to the school on leadership. And when I finished the the class, the talk, the, the dean came up and said, would you like to teach? And I said, well, I'd love to, but I, I, I just retired and I can't move to Ithaca. And he said, no problem, come up for the weekend. And so I did. And I've, been, I, I've thoroughly enjoyed my time there. Um, so uh, that's, what, that's what I wanna talk about today. The, the, our environment can be absolutely overwhelming, but, but it, 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 it surely isn't hopeless and effective leaders can succeed today where others don't. And let me just start right here. So right at the beginning of the new decade, you see down there, 6 January, 2020, the, the editor of Fortune Magazine, which is a major American business publication, laid, laid out three guiding principles for business for the next decade, and you can read them there. Capitalism should be improved, not replaced. Globalization should be shaped, not fought. But the third one is what matters to us. Leadership matters. The decade ahead will put leaders to the test and they'll need wisdom, courage, and build a reservoir of moral authority to guide us through. Wisdom, courage, and moral authority. Some things that, that he thinks effective business leaders need uh, for, for the decade of, of the 20s. 
presciently, he said this six weeks before basically the world got locked down with COVID. And we certainly saw a lot of uh, leaders out there wrestling with a, a, a very, very new and, and difficult problem, a problem which none of us knew much about. It was a problem where the leaders and the led were actually learning together. And it was, it was much like the environment I walked into in, in Iraq. But, but leadership matters and leadership uh, will, will make a difference. Now, here's what I'd like you to do. Just, just thinking about back, think back at the last two years. And think about the leaders you saw either in your work or at the local, state, national level. And just, just by yourself for, for about 90 seconds here, I want you to write down one leadership quality that you saw a, a, a leader uh, do that you said, wow, that was really good. I want to emulate that. And then I want you to think about one leadership quality that you saw that you said, wow, that's awful. I hope I never do that. So just take about 90 seconds here and, and by yourself and, and write that down. Go ahead. Emulate, avoid. It's amazing how long 90 seconds seems when you're staring at yourself on the screen. Um, normally what I do here is I, ha I have a discussion, but I think we have too many people online to, to have the discussion. But what I'd, what I'd ask you to do is keep those. Th those are two leadership qualities that are important to you. And I always have people think about leadership qualities they saw they wanted to avoid. Because honestly, I learned probably as much from watching bad leaders as I did from good leaders. So just hang on to those. Now let's go to the environment here. So shortly after uh, I, I got back from the Iraq and, uh, Iraq and and came to be the Army Chief of Staff, uh, that's basically the military leader of the American Army. Uh, I was trying, I was struggling to try to find a way to describe the world as I saw it. And, and particularly the future world, because I had to design and build an army to be ready for that future world. And I came across a book by a young man named Joshua Ramo. And in that book, he used the analogy of sand running through an hourglass and organizing itself into a sand pile at the bottom of the hourglass. And he used that as an analogy to describe our world. And what he said was, as the sands come down and organize into that sand pile, the sand pile looks relatively stable. Now you say, of course it does, General, it's a picture, but work, work with me on this. But it, from the outside, it looks relatively stable. But the reality is it's extremely unstable because every one of those grains of sand is touching another grain in ways that we could never understand or appreciate. And you never know which grain of sand coming down from the top of the hourglass is gonna cause the whole sand pile to collapse. And what he said, we live in a world where instability is the norm. It's stability that's the passing phase and complexity is only accumulated. Every, one of, every new grain of sand that comes down from the top makes the situation more complex. And he says we are that way because of the granularity, more players, more grains of sand entering every day and interdependence, more unknowable connections between the players. And, and as I thought about this, I said, I look back at how, how 
much things have changed, at least in the last 20 years. In, in, in 2001, there, there were less than 500 million people worldwide online. Today, now there, there's more than 4.7 billion people, but over 60% of the world is online and they send about 300 billion emails every day. Um, cell phones, less than a billion cell phones in, in, uh, two, in 2001. T -t Today, we're approaching seven and a half billion cell phones worldwide. I mean, over 90% of the world has a cell phone, which means when they have access to the internet, they have 24 seven access to information, which, which accounts for the fact that there are 4 million Google searches every minute of every day. That, that's granularity and, and interdependence. Uh, we're, we're connected in, in, in ways we'll never fully understand. I mean, Facebook. Facebook is approaching 3 billion users worldwide. Uh, and every minute of every day, they sh people on Facebook share 2.5 million pieces of content every minute of every day. Twitter. There's about 400,000 people uh, around the world on Twitter. They share 275,000 tweets uh, every minute, uh, every day. WeChat, Chinese version, about 1.2 billion users. And re remember that WannaCry virus back in 2017? It, it only affected about 300,000 computers worldwide, but they were in 150 different countries. That, that's, that's interdependence. And on top of that, technology is accelerating at an exponential pace and it's challenging the abilities of all of us, individuals and organizations to adapt. Environmental challenges are growing. Geop geopolitical challenges are growing and specifically what's going on in the Ukraine. And we're still in the throes of this pandemic. So things aren't gonna get any easier. We live in a world where instability is the norm Stability is the passing phase and complexity is only accumulating. And if you're gonna to succeed today, you need to accept that and you need to prepare for it. And that world is VUCA. Enter VUCA. So I got, right after, shortly after I retired, I got a call from the Dean of the Keenan Flagler Business School, University of North Carolina. She said, General, would you please come down and talk to our executive MBAs about leading in a VUCA world? Said, no, no, no problem, Dean, be there. And I hung up and I Googled VUCA because even though I knew it was an acronym, I couldn't, I didn't, couldn't remember what all the letters stood for. Well, much to my surprise and chagrin, it was a term coined, I found it was a term coined by the United States Army War College in 1989 to describe what they thought the world would look like uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And they may be right. Uh, but what I thought I'd do here is I'd take you through each of the illities uh, and I, I to, to understand the impact on people, I'm going to talk about the impact on me in my first 30 days in Iraq, because that was the most VUCA time for me before or since. And I suspect what I went through in those early days in Iraq was similar to what a lot of people went through around the early days of the pandemic. So let me start with, with volatility. As you see there, the, the rate and pace of disruption uh, impacting an organization, that, that, that's volatility. Um, I was sent into Iraq uh, and I, the ambassador and I were given 30 days. We need to come to grips with the situation on the ground. I need to establish my headquarters. He needed to establish the embassy. We had to get our get to know our teams and our Iraqi counterparts. I mean, this new government had been on the ground three days, and we and we'd never met them. And we were tasked to to come up with a plan for our, for our success. All while keeping a very difficult insurgency at bay. We couldn't tell the enemy just to take the day off. And, and then right in the middle of those very difficult first thirty days we were thrust into a major battle across the southern part of the country because a young Marine who'd been on the ground less than a week, made a wrong turn, drove too close to a militia leader's house whose picture is on that poster uh, on the slide, 
a gunfight broke out that quickly then spread across the holy city of Najaf, home to the Imam Ali Shrine, one of the holiest sites in, in Islam, then across the southern part of the country, then into the capital of Baghdad. Something well outside of our control had impacted us at a very inopportune time. Th that's volatility. Now, what's the impact? Let's think about it. What, what's the impact in, uh, on you and uh, 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 leaders of, of constant change? I, I'd, I'd say there's there's just two two that I'll talk about quickly. Um, f first of all, the constant change diverts your focus away from most important. And if you're going to succeed today, you have to do the most important things. Think about all the times you sat down on, uh, on in, in the evening and made a list of all the things you were going to get done at work the next day. And you walked into work the next, and, you, and at the end of the next day, you looked at your list and you hadn't done any of them. That's, that, that's volatility. It, it diverts your focus away from the most important things. And, and then secondly, uh, I, I found that the constant change and the constant disruption um, frust frustrates people's willingness to plan. And, and I've had seasoned military leaders and frankly, the heads of major US multinational corporations say to me, I don't know why I plan. Every time I make a plan, it changes. But to succeed today, you have to plan. As, as Dwight Eisenhower uh, used to say, it's the planning, not the plan. Just the fact that you've been through the planning process uh, gives, you, gives you an edge. So, so what can you do? What, what can you do with all this volatility and, and change going on around there? Um, you ever heard the old adage, never waste a good crisis? Uh, what, I, what I found is there's always, there's always opportunities when you think things are not going the way you want them to go. And, and a good example is, I'll continue that Najaf scenario, that when I went into uh, uh, Najaf, I, it was in the first 30 days. And I was, I frankly was overwhelmed. And it took about 24 hours to get my head around it. And I said, we have an opportunity here. We can help the Iraqi government demonstrate that they can secure their country. And so I said, restore Iraqi government control to Najaf. And about a month later we did, and the Iraqi government had their first success. Uh, never waste a good crisis. The fact that you have a crisis is, is not the problem. The problem will be if you don't learn from the crisis and come out stronger. Uncertainty, as you see there, the inability, inability to predict uh, future outcomes. Uh, in all of this vuca uh, there, there, there is always huge uncertainty. I will tell you in those early days, had an Iraqi government that was three days old, I had three battalions in the Iraqi army. I had 160,000 troops from 33 countries who were operating in a form of combat counterinsurgency that none of us had done. And we were up against a very diverse and committed enemy. And we were operating in a culture that we didn't fully understand or appreciate. I'm telling you in those early days, our outcomes were extremely uncertain. So what's the impact? What's the impact of uncertainty on leaders? Right, hesitation. Hesitation, what we, you're not sure? You hesitate and you don't act. And to succeed today, you have to act. I, I, I talk to the business school audience, I talk about the corporate duck. You know, people are confronted with a very hard problem. Uh, their reaction, duck, do nothing and hope it works out. Well, today, Hope is not a, it's not a method. Uh, what, what can you do about it? What, what, what I found is to succeed today, the leader has to get it in his or her own head. They have to form their view of the future and then act on that view. And when they act on that view, they, can, they succeed in small steps. And every time you have a success, you get more confidence and you, and you take another step and you succeed and you take another step. And, and a good example is, is to carry on that Najaf scenario. Uh, I was told to have elections five months after I got to Iraq, the first free elections in Iraq in 50 years. And I wasn't quite, I wasn't sure we could do that, but we thought about it 
uh, I said, look, I want to envision a future here where every Iraqi who wants to vote has the opportunity. And we laid out the most important things we had to do to get there. And then we started doing them. And every time we, we, we did one, we celebrated and we got more confident. Whoops, sorry. And we got more confident. Uh, and I don't know if any of you remember, but the, the, the Iraqi purple fingers, when the Iraqis voted that, that, uh, that day in January, 2005, they, if they had to dip their fingers in indelible purple ink so they couldn't vote twice. And they were all walking around holding their fingers up to the up to the television cameras. It was a remarkable day and a very emotional day in, in Iraq. Uh, but we, we framed our view of the future, we acted on that view and we created the future that we wanted. That's how you cut through uncertainty. Uh, complexity, as you see there, understanding the interaction and integration of multiple, and I will tell you, uh, competing internal and external variables. And there were days in Iraq where I looked pretty much like that woman in the picture. Um, but all those lines, all those arrows had to be straight coming out of my head. I mean, Iraq was the most complex environment I've been in before or since. And every decision I had to make, I had to consider what the US government wanted, or what the Iraqi government wanted, what the 33 countries of the coalition who were providing troops wanted, what the various Iraqi factions wanted. And that was just the good guys. In war, the enemy has a vote. And the enemy wasn't just one homogenous group. There were terrorists, there were insurgents, there were militias, and there were, there were common criminals. And they weren't all wearing different uniforms. They were all dressed like your average Iraqis. It was a hugely complex environment. Um, so so you know, what's the impact of all that complexity? I mean, it's, it's befuddling, isn't it? I mean, to me, it, it's, it, it's really hard to, to, to focus. And, and to succeed today, you have to focus the efforts of your organization on the most important elements of success. But, but when you, I always found that when I start diving into a problem to, to build my understanding of it, it, it gets harder and harder and harder and harder. And, and so it, it takes some time um, to, to, to get to know the details. But to succeed today, you have to know the details and the big picture. And, and what I found was that to get that focus that I needed, I had to dive deeply into the problem to build my understanding. And then I, I had to zoom back out to put it in context so that I could express it clearly and succinctly uh, to my folks. Zoom in to build your understanding, zoom out to be able to clearly communicate it and, and in a clear and simple way to, to your subordinates. One of the things I found was a lot of people, they zoom in and they never come back. They get stuck down there wallowing in the weeds. So complexity, understanding the integration in multiple variables. And then lastly, ambiguity. As you see, differing interpretations of the same data or, or event. So this is just wave your hands on the screen here. How many of you see the gentleman looking straight ahead? Just raise your hand. How many people see the gentleman looking to the side? You can only raise your hand once. And how many people look see both? What is that, right? That is differing interpretations of the same data or event, right? Now, now think about if we were all in, in, a, in the same company and we're working on, on a difficult policy decision. I, I have found that, that, that people see things differently because of who they are as an individual and where they sit in the organization. Right? It doesn't, shouldn't surprise anyone that the HR person might see something different than the finance person who might see it different than the operations person who might see it different than the salesperson. And in, in Iraq, you'd expect there to be ambiguity in war but and in another culture. But because we were dealing in a, in a culture that we didn't fully understand or appreciate, we rarely agreed on anything. Things that would be seem like they were crystal clear to us were seen entirely differently by the Iraqis. Now, now what's the impact of, of ambiguity on leaders? 
Well, for me, it's like it's like sand in the gears, right? You you, you never can go as fast as you want to go because you got to keep the team together. And what I found was that that ambiguity requires interpretation by the leader. And and what I would do is I'd look at this ambiguous situation and I'd say, okay, look, I have to make a decision. You know, I, sometimes I would have to brief the president the next day. So I'd say, look, I got to brief the president tomorrow that has a way of focusing the mind. And I, I'd say, so here's what I think. And here's how I see the situation. Because I see the situation like this, this is what I'm going to do. Then I'd say, okay, Fred, I know you see the situation differently. But, but like I said, this is how I see it. So this is what I'm doing. And Mary, I know this is how you see the situation, but I see it differently. So this is what I'm going to do. Because as a leader, you're trying to encourage people to give you diverse and dissenting inputs. You need to come at these hard issues from all different kinds of, all different perspectives. And the last thing you want is a consensus solution. So what I was trying to do is keep Fred and Mary on board to keep coming back and, and, and dissenting, but at the same time, laying it out there about how I saw the situation. I was interpreting the ambiguity for everybody and say, okay, you may not entirely agree with it, but that's, that's how he sees it. So that's what we're going to do. Now, what I didn't fully appreciate was that what I was also doing was I was empowering Fred and Mary to come back to me and say, hey, General, remember you said you saw it like this and I saw it like this? Well, I was right and you were wrong. And believe me, colonels love to tell generals that they were right and the general was wrong. Okay, so that's um, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. They don't just come at you one at a time, though. They come at you all together. And, and collectively, they, they combine to impede a leader's, a leader's ability to understand, to decide, to communicate, and to act decisively. But you cannot allow yourself to be cowed by the environment. This is going to be about you building a deep understanding of what it is you want to do and imposing your will on the environment and the competition. So what's it take? What's it take to lead today? Here's what I think. In the military, we say leaders need to be certain things and they need to do certain things. And, and I believe to, to lead successfully today, we men and women need to be uh, persons of vision, courage, character with an offensive mindset. And I'll talk to you about that in a second. But they also have to do the right things. They have to focus their intellectual and emotional energy in the areas that have the highest payoff for the organization. And you see there that those are the, those are the four, what I call focus areas. They're the areas where I have found uh, over the years that if leaders focus their intellectual and emotional energy on these four areas, it has the highest payoff for the organization. I'll say a couple of words about these four, then I want to go back and, and finish up with uh, what we need meant, uh, leaders to be. Um, first of all, point the way ahead. Number one responsibility for a leader, point the way ahead. And, and that's really hard in the VUCA world because you could be wrong and there, and there could be significant consequences. There's two questions that I, simple questions that I've asked myself uh, as I'm trying to solve hard problems. The first question is, what are we really trying to accomplish? And, and even though it sounds like a simple question, the higher I, I got, the harder it was to answer that question clearly and succinctly, yet the more important it was that I answer it clearly and succinctly because it focused the efforts of the organization. And the second, question I would ask is, okay, if that's most important, what are the most important things we have to do to accomplish that? Most important. And you can imagine when I was trying to figure out how to lead the army, you imagine the list of things I had that we had to do that the people thought were most important. Most, when you, when you do that, it helps you form a strategy because strategies help you prioritize. And, and you will always have competition and you will always have limited resources. And so asking the questions, what, what is most important to accomplishing uh, what, what it is we want to accomplish, uh, those two simple questions uh, can help you uh, come up with the right answers and point the way ahead. And you can do them at any level of leadership. 
Um, second one is building the power of your team. People make the difference. They will be the difference in, in, in our uh, digital world. They will, they, they will be your, your comparative advantage. And as I look at a lot of businesses, particularly small and medium-sized businesses, they don't invest in the team. They think if they get the bonus, the bonus structure right, that everybody's okay. People want to be part of an organization that, that has a, a common purpose. And what I have found is that building commitment to that common purpose is, is a start point for building a team. People will make the difference. It's worth the investment. Third one is make it happen. And they don't teach you this in the Army War College. This is one of those things you got to figure out by yourself. Um, but I, I, over the course of my career, I kept seeing, I run into people that say, well, if only someone would do this, I, I could, I'd be successful. Or if only someone would do that, I'd be successful. And I'd say, hey, look, there can't be any if onlys. If it's important to the accomplishment of what it is you're trying to do, you go out and make it happen. And one of my favorite stories uh, in, in this regard is, is Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs is getting ready to put out the iPhone. And so it's late 2006, early 2007. And he, he realizes that the, the glass he's got in there now isn't hard enough. And, and he's not gonna put the iPhone out uh, with, without, uh, until, it's, until it's perfect, until it meets his standards. And so he looks around for folks who have, uh, make really hard glass. And he hears Corning Glass has something called Gorilla Glass. So he gets on a plane and he flies to Corning, New York. And he goes in and sees Wendell Weeks. He says, Wendell, uh, I need Gorilla Glass for my iPhones. And now this is the Jobs version of the story. So not, not the Corning story. He says, Wendell, I, I, need, I need Gorilla Glass. He says, I'm sorry, Steve. You know, we closed that plant a few years ago. Um, we're just not doing it. He says, Wendell, get your head around this. I need it in six months. So when Weeks turns everything on its head, six months later, he's crank cranking out Gorilla Glass for the iPhone. And for his trouble, to date, Corning Glass has put uh, Gorilla Glass in 4.3 billion Apple devices. But, but Jobs saw what he needed, and he went out and he made it happen. Uh, that's what effective leaders do. And then lastly, you have to keep an eye on the future. The leader is the future's person for the organization. You ever seen a bunch of geese uh, around a pond? There's always one goose with its head up, right? That's the sentry goose. It's looking around to make sure that the other geese don't get eaten by the fox while they're having their dinner. Leader's the sentry goose for the organization. You're the, you're the one who's responsible for preparing the organization for success. Because your, your last quarterlies are what? their history, and as a leader to prepare the organization for success in the future. So let me just shift back up to, to B here, and then I'll, I'll just wrap this up and, and, and uh, turn it over for questions. Vision, courage, character, and an offensive mindset. Vision. Leaders need the ability to see around corners, to, to, to see something significant about the future that's not readily apparent to others. Uh, but, but how do you build that? How do you, how do you get that way? I mean, Lieutenant Casey was not very visionary. Lieutenant Casey was trying to make it through the day. But I, I found that my vision, my ability to develop vision was a product of my education, my experience, my intuition, and an external and a future focus. And, and it's something that I built over time and built over time largely by making a mistake. Um, education, the, the Jesuits got me and the Christian brothers got me in high school and, and they instilled in me a, an, an inquisitive mind and a commitment to lifelong learning that was only reinforced in, in the army. Um, experience, I tended to take the hard jobs. I, I wanted to challenge myself and, and, I, and prepare myself for the next level. And, and what I found was people knew they were hard jobs and they tended to be more forgiving than, than of my mistakes, which I made a lot of, uh, as I was trying to do the right do the right thing, um, and then intuition. You know, over, over time, you'll build a feel, you'll you'll be able to build a sense for things. And what I tried to do was not knee jerk when I had that feeling. 
I had a feeling about something. When I did that, my, my staff called them epiphanies. You know, the general had an epiphany about this and epiphany about that. But what I do is I'd say, okay, uh, what I usually do is I'd say, okay, here's what I'm seeing. I get a small group together and say, here's what I'm seeing. What do you see? And if they said, yeah, we're seeing the same thing, then we put a large group together and we flesh it out. And if we didn't, I kind of file it in the back of my mind. And then lastly, that external and future focus. Your, your organization will tend to suck you inside. And if you're not that, looking around like that sentry goose, you know, if you have your head up, you're, you're going to get eaten by the fox. Um, so vision, courage, um, make, pointing a clear way ahead in a VUCA in, environment is risky. You could be wrong and there could be significant consequences. And nothing good happens without risk. So it takes courage to act in the face of all that uncertainty and risk. Churchill has my favorite quote on courage. He said, it, it's the first among human qualities because it guarantees all the others. To succeed today, you have to act and it takes courage to act. Character. Leaders with strong values build strong organizations, period. But from a moment a man or woman comes into the army, the seven army values are instilled in them. Loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. And everyone, every man and woman in the army is held accountable from private to four-star general to those values. Why, why are they so important? Because leaders trust men and women with strong values because they'll, they trust them to do the right thing for the organization and not themselves when the going gets tough. And your values are only tested when you get tough. And then lastly, that offensive mindset. As you see, they're opportunistically creating the future you want through action. Everything about this environment, this VUCA environment combines to put you on the back foot. And you won't make good decisions from the back foot. When I first went to Iraq, the environment was so overwhelming. I was, I was concerned about that with my, with my leaders. And I said, I want you to have an offensive mindset. I want you to focus on the enemy and I want you to be opportunistic. You need the same type of mentality today. How do you build it? How do you get this offensive mindset? Interestingly, it starts with humility. That might sound, sound incongruous to you. But look, you have to accept the fact that we're human. We can't read people's mind. We can't predict the future. And there will always be things that we can't and we won't know. In the army, we say, there's only two kinds of plans. Those that might work and those that won't work. Because we're human, the best we're going to do is a plan that might work. And I found having that mentality allowed, allowed me to reach really high for things and then not be overly disappointed when I didn't get all the way. I got more than I would have gotten, but, I, but not be overly disappointed. Second, you got to accept the VUCA paradox. And, and some of you might have seen the, the, the book, uh, uh, Great by Choice by Jim Collins. He's American leadership guru. And he, it, he looked at 20,400 companies. And he looked for companies that outperformed their industry by 10 times over a decade. He found seven, seven. And you don't think the other uh, 20,393 CEOs are out there busting their humps to succeed? Sure they were. But, but he also found that all of them accepted, he called it the control, non-control paradox. I call it the VUCA paradox. He ex they accepted the fact that their environments would be VUCA, but they didn't accept the fact that external factors would determine their results. They imposed their will on their environment and created the future that they wanted. Third is you got, you got to do your homework. This is not an environment where you're going to Google the solution. And when I first went to Iraq, someone gave me a, a, a calendar and had Sun Tzu quotes every day, new Sun Tzu quote every day. And one of the quotes that stuck with me was, Enlightened leaders make decisions with a clear mind and a pure heart. And I thought about that and because that's how I tried to make decisions. Uh, I tried to make them with a clear mind. I dove deeply into the problem. Uh, I, I tried to pull in as much information as I could. 
I, I, I pulled in diverse and dissenting opinions because I wanted to see the, the, the issue from all different perspectives. But at the end of the day, I was getting committing soldiers to combat. I had to be able to look myself in the mirror and say, uh, I, I did my homework. And then I had to do it with a pure heart. I also had to be able to look myself in the mirror and say, I'm doing this because I believe it is the absolute right thing to do for the organization at this point in time, that I'm not doing it to cover my butt or, or anything else. This, I'm doing it because it's the right thing to do. And if I could do that, make, say I was making this decision with a clear mind and a pure heart, that gave me the conviction that the plan might work. And that gave me the courage to act uh, in the face of all the uncertainty and risk. And lastly, you got to continuously assess and adapt. So think, let's go back and review the bidding. So the, you got to plan, you, the, the best plan you're going to do is one that might work, right? And then Helmut von Mulkey, the great Prussian general, said no plan survives first contact with the enemy. All right, so you only got one plan that might work and you know it's going to change. So why are we surprised? The question is not, is the plan going to change? The question is, are you going to be ready to take advantage of it? So you need to have a process to, in, in, in a mindset that is out there continuously assessing and adapting to what's really going on. So that's it. To be an effective leader today, you need to be men and women of vision, courage, and character with an offensive mindset and focus your intellectual and emotional energies in the area that has the highest payoff for the organization. And with that, I will stop and turn it and please take uh, any, any questions that you, you might want to ask. That was great, General. Thank you very much. Uh, great, great talk, great insights. Um, we have lots and lots of questions coming in. Uh, so I'll just get started with a few of them. Um, how leadership, how should leadership change in the world of VUCA transformations like digital ESG sustainability in parentheses? I mean, I, 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 gave, I gave that construct. I mean, those are the things that I think people need to do in, in any environment. Um, you know, when, when you get a new uh, digital problem, right? What do you have to do? You have to dive deeply in it to build your understanding. And then you have to zoom back out to put it in to put it in context. And then you have to go to your people, and you have to make sure that your people understand, you know, what it is that you want them to accomplish. And, you know, it, it's sim clarity and simplicity are the antidote to all the the vulcanness go going on out there. And you know, Steve Jobs used to say, to make something simple, you have to go deep. So as I said, to, as, a, as a leader today, you have to understand the details and, and the big picture. So when you get a new technical problem, I mean, if it's, if, it's a, if it's a really important technical problem for the, for the organization, you know, the leader's not gonna get in, fix and be involved in the fixing computers. But if, but if it's something completely new, if it's essential to the accomplishment of the organization's mission, the leader needs to understand it. They, they can't rely on, on tech people to come in and they, they, they can rely on them to give them advice, but, but they have to have it in their head. Because what I found is, is I had in my own mind, I had to know what was most important. And I couldn't do that unless I had a deep understanding of the problem. The, the, the second thing I'd say about that is, it, you all are probably a lot smarter than me, but, but I believe the human mind works iteratively that you don't get a really hard, complex problem and sit down and get it at the first meeting, right? I, I, I went, I had to go to National Security Council meetings for years and I watched some of the smartest, hardest working, most dedicated people in the country wrestling with these intractable, intractable problems. And they didn't get it. They didn't, not only did they get it on the first bite, they didn't get on the second, third, or fourth. They're just, it's really hard. And, and I found that the more I worked it, the, the sharper I saw it. And it, ju it just takes time. Yeah, two things you, you said. I, I've had the good fortune to, to talk to a lot of people who have done sort of big, audacious things. And I'm always sort of pleasantly surprised by 
what I see is captured by one of what, something Einstein said, which is if you if you can't make it simple, you don't understand it. Right. And and then you also talked about the seeing the big picture and the you know the hundred thousand foot level and also the you know on the ground level, uh, the forest and the trees, and that's definitely a theme in systems thinking that that systems thinking struggles with, and. Uh, what I'm struck by is that when when I talk to folks that do these things, they always have sort of a very simple. It's simple. It's not. It's not what you would expect. It's not complicated. So, can you talk a little bit about about the, the like? I think sometimes we distrust simplicity, and we think that boy, George, General George Casey, he's got to be you know so much complicatedness, and yet you just gave us you know five or seven principles that could change the the world kind of thing. So. Talk a little bit about that simplicity. Yeah, you know, it, 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 it is critical, but you know, but sometimes I would ask myself, is this simplistic <laughs> or is it simple? That's right. And, but I, I very much agree with what you said about Einstein. I mean, I, I would have generals come into my office trying to explain a complex problem to me. And I'd say, hey, look, if, if you can't explain it in a sentence or two, you don't really understand it. I mean, just for the folks out there, think about it. Think about when you, you've started working on a new problem at the office, right? And you go home and your significant other says to you, what'd you do today? Well, I started working on this new problem. Well, what kind of problem is it? Well, it's, uh, uh, well, uh, 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 well, you haven't got it yet, right? You said it's complicated. And it's just, it just takes time. And I know uh, people get frustrated when they don't see the answer just like that. But that's the reality that you have to deal with. When none of us, I mean, all these folks, the, the Elon Musk and the Steve Jobs and, all, and you know all those folks that, that are out there, they, they built to, to where they got o over years. It, it didn't come with a snap. Right. I love I love this next question from the audience. Uh, I'd love to hear your answer to it. That if you could change or influence one thing in K twelve education today to create a better tomorrow, what would it be? Um, well, I, I, I think that I would start uh, focusing on uh, resilience. I, I, I started a program in the Army called Comprehensive Soldier Fitness to, to give soldiers the skill, skills to deal with the challenges that, that we were asking them to face in combat. But, but our, my experience was that young people today don't necessarily have the coping skills to deal with all of these VUCA things that are going on out there. And so starting at an early age to give them the, the, kind, the skills that it, the coping skills that they need, uh, I, I think is something that is, would be most significant. One of the things that, that we found when we implemented this program, that the people who embraced it first in the army were the drill sergeants. I mean, think about that. Think of these, the drill sergeants, you think about heavy metal jacket, all these yeah. screaming guys, you know, <laughs> but, but, but it was, the, they, they, they embraced it first because the 17 to 24 year old recruits that were coming in there, they embraced it. Yeah. And, and I think that's, I think that's really important. And, and I, I, I teach at Cornell, I teach at university of Denver and, and, uh, and get involved with folks out there. And it's, um, that they're seeing the same thing at the college level that the kids aren't necessarily students aren't necessarily coming in with the, with the coping skills so i so if there was something to be added to it to to help people pre be prepared to lead more effectively today i think it would be that people need to know how to cope and not be overwhelmed by everything well yeah because you you mentioned the first thing that all this vuca does is kind of overwhelm you right so if you if your first response is to uh is to not be able to deal with that, then no, nothing else matters. <laughs> right. Um, another question from the audience: What's the most important lesson you learned from war, and have you found any patterns for possible ways of preventing war? Um, you know, the, the most the, the most important thing um, that, that I think about, I, I learned. A, in war was, the, and it's not, this is a lesson relearned, it's the cost. And 
you know, leaders need to be very, very clear in their own minds that what they're asking their servicemen and women to do is going to be worth the cost because we're talking lives. And, and that, that that's the hardest thing that, that that's that I think is, is, is the lasting lesson I take um, a, a, away from that. I mean, I, I had about I had 2026 service men and women, men and women killed in Iraq under my command. And I think about them every day. What was the second part of the question? Have you found any patterns for possibly possible ways of preventing war? Um, no, you know, just look what's going on in the Ukraine right now. I, I mean, one would one would have thought that was would have, would would have been preventable, but but it it's not. You know, we we put in all these systems after World War II so that would never happen again, and and you know. Uh, there, there's no there's no clear way to prevent it other than something that I learned in Iraq from the Iraqis is you got to keep talking you got to and you got to talk to everybody you can't just talk to your friends you, you got to talk to everybody and there's a <laughs> in Arabic and I'll probably I know I'll butcher the Arabic I do I do is Siddiqui the enemy the enemy is my friend and and you have to talk to your enemies and you have to talk to your friends uh, but the more people talk and 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 the more people listen to what the what the folks on the other side of the table are 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 saying, um, we get a better chance of, of of preventing wars. I'm on a on a a group of four American retired generals, and we have been talking to a group of four retired Russian generals since November 2020. And two weeks ago, we just had our first session since the war started. And you know, we, we, we had a dialogue and, and quite surprisingly, uh, only one of the, there were only three there that day, but only one of, of the retired Russian generals really gave us the party line. The, the, the others, other two were much more measured and, and you know, they're military people, you know, they understand, they see, they know what's going on wow. and, and they know what's going on there isn't right. Hmm. Well, General George Casey, I would love to spend hours uh, talking with you, but uh, we'll we'll wrap there. There's uh, thousands of questions, but uh, I know that uh, with time and things, uh, we should wrap it up. But thank you so much for uh, for joining us today. Uh, your wisdom is is really quite profound, and I hope people got uh, the simplicity and the complexity of what what you talked about today. Okay, well, thanks. And let's let's have dinner when I'm up there in the fall. Absolutely. All right. All right. Take care. Take yeah, care.